Uh, did you? Uh, that's not an easy question to answer. Actually. Can I just skip that one? Welcome to Ask an Expert, the show where we take your questions from the Twitterverse about the topics we cover at Singularity University. I'm Ramez Nam. What's that? Do I hear a tweet? Oh look, a Tweety Bird. Robert J. Bennett, my buddy, hey Robert, how's it going, asks, what geoengineering proposals do you think have the most legs to them? So Robert's asking about geoengineering. What the heck is geoengineering? Geoengineering is changing the face of the planet, and here specifically it means doing the opposite of what we've done to cause climate change. We've caused climate change by emitting this carbon pollution into the atmosphere. So geoengineering is asking, can we do something to reverse that effect? And in theory, yeah. I don't think any geoengineering proposal is perfect, but there's two basic ways we can go about changing the planet. One is we could suck carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and stuff it back into where it came from in old uh, oil deposits or coal deposits. And that would address the fundamental cause of climate change, but it's big and expensive. The other one that's maybe easier is to reflect more sunlight into space. When Mount Pinatubo in the Philippines exploded a while ago, it cooled the planet by about a degree Fahrenheit for a year or two. And that actually wasn't that much. It was particulates that came out of it, fine sulfur particles, and it wasn't that much of it. We could spray the upper atmosphere with these fine particles that would reflect just a little bit of excess sunlight back into space, you know, half a percent of the sunlight that comes in, and that would cool the planet. Now, it wouldn't solve ocean acidification because the carbon dioxide we emit from our smokestacks still goes into the ocean and acidifies them. It would change rainfall patterns, so that has some downsides. But I think it's smart to have as an emergency backup. If we see that parts of the planet, like the Arctic, where there's lots of buried carbon, lots of buried methane, if that starts to heat up too fast and we're at risk of all of that going into the atmosphere, it's nice to have an option like this solar radiation management, spraying these aerosols to reflect sunlight to try to rapidly cool that area. So that's what I think is most useful to us in the near term. There are, there are other crazier ones. That option is already crazy and it's hard to manage because multiple countries could, any of them, could do it without asking permission. Uh, but there are crazier ideas. If you uh, put finely ground limestone into the ocean, it'll absorb CO2 in a way that doesn't acidify the ocean. People talked about we could blow up some mountains and dump them into the ocean. Uh, whether or not that really makes a lot of sense is a, is a wider question. It's not something that I advocate. Well, the like things that are made of limestone, um, in particular, the limestone goes into the atmosphere, goes into the ocean, and when it hits carbonic acid, it binds it up and neutralizes it. It's like adding baking soda to an over-acidified pool, uh, sort of. Oh yeah. Turn the turn the mountain into baking soda. <laughs> What's that I hear? Is that a tweet I hear? What have you got for me now? Ah, I can't catch this tweet. Paul Haar asks, isn't most of the cost of carbon capture the energy cost? Does cheap solar change the equation? That's a great question. So when we talk about carbon capture, we're talking about a kind of geoengineering, sucking the carbon pollution that we've caused out of the atmosphere and putting it away someplace safe. Right now, most of the cost is not the energy cost. Most of the cost is the building of these machines that would do the sucking. So it's capital cost that's up front. But when we look at where the costs could go, over time, the cost of making more factories that suck carbon out of the atmosphere would drop, and energy would be more and more of the cost. The energy cost is sort of the lower bound. So yeah, cheap solar will help that, but really we have to bootstrap that industry and get it off the ground first for the biggest initial cost declines to happen. So the real problem with carbon capture is not what most people think. Many experts say the problem with carbon capture is we haven't done the research and development to make it work. That's not true. That's not the real issue. The real issue is this. There's no business model. There's no profit in taking pollution out of the atmosphere and sticking it somewhere safe. Uh, if we paid people to clean up the atmosphere, then we'd create an incentive for them to do so. But until there is an incentive to capture carbon from the atmosphere and put it away someplace safe, it's just not going to happen at scale. And if there is an incentive to do so, that will fund the research and development and the scaling of industry that brings down those costs. But we've got to give that incentive first if we want that to happen. Do, 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 do. Oh, look, a tweet. There we go. 
All right. Ricardo Walker asks, Hi, Ramez. I was wondering if you were working on any new novels. After reading the Nexus trilogy, can't wait for more. Smiley face. Thanks, Ricardo. You'll get your 20 later. I will work on a new novel next year. I have the three Nexus novels out, Nexus, Crux, and Apex. They won the Prometheus Award and the Philip K. Dick Award, uh, and I'm very proud of that. And I'm working on a new novel next year focused on AI. Thanks for watching Ask an Expert. I'm Ramez Nam. Check back next week for a new episode. Over here is another video from Singularity U. And don't forget to click here to subscribe. You can find me on Twitter, at Hermes. Bye.